Hi everybody, thank you for joining us for this week's weekly webinar. My name is Molly Keck and I am an entomologist with the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service. And today we're going to be talking about spiders. Are they good? Are they bad? Are they just plain creepy? I think you'll be surprised to learn that most spiders are actually beneficial. There's very few spiders that are harmful to humans medically. Um, and most of the time we really want to have those spiders in our landscape. So just a little background about spiders. There are only about 30 spiders worldwide that are harmful to humans in the medical sense and that if they bite you, you can have a bad reaction to them. Within the United States, we only have about two types of spiders that are actually harmful to us. And those are generally in the widows and the recluse groups. There are other species of spiders, um, but there really is very little, if not any evidence to indicate that they are medically, significantly medically important to humans. So for now, we really believe that it's just the widows and the recluses that are harmful to humans. So that means every other spider is considered beneficial. That's a lot of species of spiders that are good for, for us to have around. What makes a spider and an insect different from one another? Insects are not arachnids, spiders are. And arachnids, including spiders, have only two body parts, whereas insects have three. So insects are like a uh, snowman, whereas a spider is more like a figure eight. It, spiders also have eight functioning legs or four pairs of legs, whereas insects only have six legs or three pairs of legs. Insects also have a couple things that spiders do not ever have. Insects always have antenna and insects have the ability to have up to two pairs of wings. They may not always have wings, but they can have up to two pairs or four wings total. So other things that are related to spiders and are also considered arachnids are anything that have eight legs, two body parts, and no antenna. They also don't have wings. And so if you look at all of these guys, while they may look very different, they're all related and they're all considered to be arachnids because they have eight legs to them. So mites, ticks, and scorpions are considered relatives of spiders because they are arachnids. They have eight legs, they have two body parts, they have no antenna, and they have no wings either. There's also some really cool looking arachnids that resemble spiders um, more, and those are the sulfugid or the camel spider, which is on the right hand side, and then whip scorpions or vinegaroons, which is on the left hand side. The sulfugid um, or the camel spider is also sometimes called a wind spider because it's very, very fast. And these guys, Other relatives of spiders, which are also arachnids, might look more similar to a spider. So for instance, the uh, wind scor wh whip scorpion on the left-hand side, or the vinegaroon, or the sulfugid or camel spider on the right-hand side. Uh, sulfugids or camel spiders are also sometimes called wind spiders because they're very, very fast. And these guys are much more common in arid areas within Texas. They can be found in the San Antonio area, but just go a little further west and they're much more common and easier to encounter if you're in West Texas, as opposed to Central or even East Texas or South and even North Texas. There's also some really cute little things called a pseudoscorpion. That's a relative of an insect. It's like a miniature, teeny tiny, funny looking little scorpion, um, pretty harmless to humans. And then daddy long legs or a pilionis or harvest men, there's a number of names are also considered arachnids, but they're not spiders. They're, a spider is a type of arachnid. So sometimes you hear people say that daddy long legs are not spiders. That is correct, but they're still arachnids. Just like a scorpion is not a spider, but it's still an arachnid. So I always get asked, do spiders bite? Well, all spiders have fangs. So they have essentially two teeth. And yes, they have the ability to bite if they want it to. Spiders hunt for prey and for their food, and they use their, their fangs to grab their prey, to kill their prey, and then to consume their prey. They know that you are too large for them to take down, and so they are very unlikely to um, bite you unless you accidentally touch them first or you do grab one first. But most spiders, by and large, even if you held it, would not want to use its mouth parts to try to bite you. But I also always say is I have teeth. Um, so if you ask, does a dog bite? Well, dogs have teeth. They have the ability to bite, but I will bite you too if you stick your finger in, in my mouth. 
So spiders might bite you if you touch them or bother them first, but they will not actively hunt you out just to bite you. So let's talk about the harmful spiders before we talk about the good guys. The two harmful spiders are our widows and our recluse spider. Recluse spiders, there's multiple species of recluse spider. The most common one is the brown recluse, of course, um, but there are many species of recluse spiders. However, they all look pretty much the same. Recluse spiders are small with skinny legs. Um, they're kind of hairy if you look at them under the microscope. They're just kind of a drab brown color. They're only about the size of a quarter, even with their legs spread out. So they're not very large spiders at all. And the big characteristic they have is that they have that fiddle or that violin that's on their uh, backside, on their cephalothorax. And there you can kind of see the fiddle or the violin a little bit better there. It kind of looks like a um, guitar. But there are some species of spiders that resemble a recluse spider very, very closely, even to the point of where it looks like they have that fiddle or violin on their back. So the best way to tell the difference between the two is to look at the pattern of the eyes. Sometimes immature or baby recluse spiders will not have that uh, fiddle pattern on its back, but they always, always, always have six eyes that are set in pairs. They have three pairs of eyes around their head. Other spiders have generally eight eyes and they're never in that paired pattern that you see. So that is the best way to identify that you have a recluse spider versus other species of spiders. Generally, you'll need a, a hand lens or a good magnifying glass or maybe a microscope to see this, but you can see it with, with magnification. You just can't really see it with the naked eye. Recluse spiders live a pretty long time, and this is probably because they enjoy living inside with us where temperatures are regulated. They're reclusive, so there's not a whole lot of um, predators that they might encounter that might kill them. So they live about one to two years, which is a pretty significantly long life for any kind of an, an arthropod. They can lay um, about 50 eggs May through July. So right now they're starting to breed and lay eggs. Um, the spiderlings will emerge within a month after laying their eggs. And then they just kind of, um, their populations just build exponentially. So if they're hiding in a closet somewhere, it's only a year before you've got, you know, hundreds more spiders than you had before. Maybe you only had five females. Well, if each one's laying 50 eggs, you pretty soon have a pretty good population. The bite of a recluse spider um, eats away at the tissue. It's um, necrotic and it's considered a cytotoxin. And the damage that it inflicts really depends on the amount of venom that you receive. Most bites usually heal without any scarring, but you have heard and have seen horror stories, I'm sure, of people that have really intensive scarring or they've lost digits after a, a recluse spider has bitten them. So they can cause um, some pretty bad reactions in humans um, and lifelong effects, but for the most part, most bites heal without scarring. Usually starts as a pustule that will never actually heal, um, and then it gets worse and worse and because, becomes necrotic. There's other factors that affect your reaction to the recluse spider bite. What is your overall health? Um, how, how good is your immune system? What area of the body were you bitten in? How much tissue is it affecting? How much venom did you actually get? So it's very hard to look at a spider bite or any reaction on the skin and know if a recluse spider actually caused it without knowing specifically that, that, that you collected a spider that you know bit you in the spot that you're seeing that reaction. Recluse spiders love reclusive places. They like dark, undisturbed sites, cluttered areas. They love closets. They love um, behind bookshelves and underneath desks and, and um, places where you just have a lot of clutter in a tiny space so that they're not often disturbed. So um, these types of habitats will usually allow them to have very high populations. Um, they are found indoors and outdoors, but they are more common, I would say, inside in cluttered places. Outdoors, they're found in all those same spots that you know you find spiders and scorpions and other things. So they're found in barns and storage sheds, garages, attics, basements, cellars, that kind of thing. Um, underneath logs, under stones, places you're a little bit afraid to stick your hand. When you're trying to control recluse spiders, patience is definitely a key. 
Prevention is important. Do things, if you know that they're outside, do things to keep them from getting inside. Make sure your window screens are sealed nice and tight, that there's not holes in them. Make sure that your door sweeps or your um, weather stripping around your door is um, securely placed onto the door frame. Seal up cracks and crevices. Use yellow lights as opposed to other colored lights, which are going to attract insects, which are their food source that they're going to go hunting for. Remove junk and debris and things that, that cause a lot of clutter so there's less hiding places for them to, to be found. Sticky traps are a fabulous way to monitor for brown recluse inside of your house. If you know that you have an issue with them, put sticky traps everywhere and monitor those regularly. And that way you get an idea of what rooms or areas of the house they're more commonly found in, but also you get an idea of when the population might be going down. So whatever it is that you're doing is working or if it's not and if the population is rising. Vacuuming is important as a homeowner. Suck up all the egg sacs, suck up all the spiders, suck up all the, um, the food that they might be feeding on. Use a fly swatter to try to, to swat the ones that you see alive. Don't let a live one live. Go ahead and step on it or use your fly swatter. Most of the time you want to use a pest management professional to come in, use the right products in the right places so that you're less exposed and your family is less exposed to the pesticides. The second type of spider that is harmful is a widow spider. There are black widows and there are brown widows and there's multiple species of the black colored widows. They're usually black. Um, they're always very shiny. They're hairless. They have a very globular abdomen to them. They have a very particular um, characteristic look. But the underside of the abdomen has an, a red hourglass and there might be some dotting or um, marking above or below the hourglass, but it always has the two triangles touching at the thin parts, an hourglass on the underside of the abdomen where it's going to hang from. Only the females are considered venomous, but you don't know if it's a male or a female, so you don't want to encounter one and, and let it bite you. Um, these guys will mate in the spring through the summertime, and they lay their eggs in these little sack webs that you can see in that picture. And once those eggs hatch, the babies are called spiderlings, and they will disperse by something called ballooning, which is where they... they um, spin a silk thread and they allow the wind to take them. So whereas a recluse spider really doesn't leave its initial home, it stays kind of put, widows disperse and spread all over the place, which is why they're much more common outdoors than they are indoors, although they have been known to be found inside. One single female can lay up to 250 eggs. That is a lot of babies. That The widow spider's type of venom is called a neurotoxin and it is considered to be 15 times more deadly than rattlesnake venom but you don't receive as much as you do from a rattlesnake. So you receive a very, very small amount. The chance of you actually, this being a fatal amount of venom for you to take in is very, very, very small. I do, if you can do a literature search and you can try to find cases of where widows have bitten someone and they've actually died from it. And I would, I would make a very, um, probably very educated and very close guess by saying that it is far less than probably uh, way less than 1% of all of the bites that happen. I mean, this is a very, very slim chance that this, you'll die from this. I also hear people say that you, once you're bitten by one, you have to get to the doctor within five minutes. And that's not necessarily the case either. Things will happen to you that let you know that you don't feel good and you need to go seek medical attention. The severity really depends on where on your body you're bitten. Again, your, how allergic you are to it, what your already your immune system response is going to be, how, what your overall health is, um, and the amount of venom that you received from that bite. The neurotoxin acts on your nervous system. So things will happen to you like you can't breathe properly. Um, you might feel extreme pain in your large muscle groups, like in your legs or in your abdomen or maybe in your back. Things don't feel right in your body and you know your body's not functioning properly and that's when you seek medical attention. It's not quick and immediate. Um, you will have time to go and get some, some help. Most of the time, widow spiders um, spend inside of their web, which they're utilizing to catch food and their webbing is very messy. It's not a nice pretty web. It's like someone took um, like a cotton ball and spread it out really thin. Um, it's messy, it's dirty. And they really also like the undisturbed and cluttered places. So outside they like sheds or, or undercover, they like sheds and garages and basements, crawl spaces and closets. But outside they like to be under debris. They might be in 
um, an old skull that's that's laid out in a field somewhere, but they like to hide in um, uh, protected places that are usually covered. They're not going to expose themselves to the sunlight. So um, underneath trash cans, underneath rocks, in in um, firewood piles, things like that. To control the widows, you really want to target the webs because that's where they spend most of their time. You can apply pesticides to those webs, and as they crawl across it, spend a lot of time on it, they're exposed to the pesticides. Um, I would inspect them at night, the webbing at night, to see if they're actually active or if it's an old web. Eliminate hiding places, just like with um, the brown recluse. Get rid of clutter and things that might encourage them to find harborage and vacuum thoroughly. Vacuum up the egg sacs, vacuum up their food sources, vacuum up the webbing and vacuum up any little um, black widow or widow brown widow that you might see crawling around. So those are the bad spiders. But most spiders that we come across are actually beneficial and encouraged to have in our landscape because they're eating lots of other things out of the landscape for us. So everybody but a brown recluse or a widow spider is going to be um, a good guy. There are different types of spiders and you can group them into different categories. And one of those categories are orb weavers. All of these guys that you see pictured here are the spiny orb weavers. Um, they are spiders that, that build wheel shaped webs, nice pretty little orbs. I kind of consider them to be the, the spiders that um, Charlotte Webb, Charlotte's Web was probably written to describe. And they utilize those webs to catch their prey. So they don't actively hunt for their prey, they stay within their web to try to catch that prey. Other types of orb weavers might look like these guys. They can be much larger in size, a little bit scarier in appearance. These, of course, are going to have larger orbs or webs. Um, the golden silk orb weaver, the middle one is the long-jawed orb weaver. He has long front legs and, and big petty palps that cover up his jaws. He just has a really funny-looking face. And then the western spotted orb weaver there on the right-hand side, which is almost like a garden spider. Um, but we'll show you some pictures of what true garden spiders are. You got humpbacked and you have the giant lichen, um, furrow orb weavers kind of have very large globular abdomens also, but they're not a black widow because they are hairy um, and they're not so shiny and smooth, at least in these pictures. A lot of you have probably seen garden spiders in your landscape. Garden spiders are very large spiders, very colorful, very pretty. Um, we've got banded, black and yellow, and silver garden spiders. The black and yellow is the one that's actually here on the right-hand side. The silver is in the center. Um, the banded, and probably the black and yellow is the most common in San Antonio, banded being the second most common. And, and at least in, in my experience, I don't often get people that send me pictures of the silver garden spider, but they are native um, and they are found here. Uh, they're in the Argiope or Argiope um, genus. So some people also call them Argiope or, or Argiope spiders. Crab spiders are interesting looking spiders. And of course they're named as such because they resemble crabs in the way that their legs are all spread out and how their front two sets of legs are generally longer than the back legs. They're also able to move sideways and backwards. So they not only look like a crab, but they move resembling a crab as well. These guys don't build webs. So instead they hunt, actively hunt for their food or they might ambush their predators. So the one that's on the, the bottom on this uh, yellow flower is waiting for a pollinator to come and then it's going to ambush that pollinator and eat it. So um, all those spiders are beneficial in that they're eating insects out of our landscape. Sometimes they will eat good insects. They they're Very rarely will you find a beneficial insect that is specific to just a bad guy. Usually they're kind of, they eat what is available to them. One of my favorite types of spiders is called a jumping spider. Jumping spiders have the ability to hop, and that's how they get that name, of course. Um, but they're very, very cute. They have, they're the ones that always have big eyes that look at you, um, seem to have little personalities, look like little aliens from Star Wars. They're good predators, actively hunting for their food also. Um, you might find them on plants, but you'll find them pretty much anywhere. They'll crawl all over the place. And I would say that this bull jumper on the bottom left is one that gets commonly confused and mistaken and worried for being a black widow but it is very hairy. It doesn't have the look of a black widow to me. And people will, will see marking on the back side and just assume marking on the abdomen's gotta be a black widow. Black widow marking, remember, is always red or orangey in color. It is not white like this. 
some of the jumping spiders can look really interesting and have really colorful looks to them. Um, velvety in color, but these guys can hop also and I think are just sometimes spiders. We usually think of them as being brown or gray or black, but sometimes they can be very vibrant in color and actually very colorful, pretty things in the landscape. Wolf spiders are another one that are really common. They're also often mistaken for um, brown recluse. And I think it's just because on the backside, they might look like they have a little bit of a pattern to them. But a wolf spider is quite a bit larger than a brown recluse is. Brown recluse is only about the size of a quarter, even with the, the wing, the legs spread out. Whereas the wolf spiders can get very, very large. They are hairy, brown, gray in color, very active hunters, usually actively feeding at night. So they're gonna to prefer to eat crickets and moths and other things. They make no webbing. They very rarely climb plants. They're always found on the soil surface, hiding under rocks, hanging out usually in rock and cactus gardens um, and actively hunting for any prey that might come their way for them to catch. Lynx spiders are kind of a really cute looking spider that has um, long little hairs that protrude off of its legs. So we've got um, striped lynx spiders and green lynx spiders and the striped lynx male looks very, very different. They seem to be more common around October for some reason, um, but if you go outside, you will definitely find some adults and some immatures. Around October is when they will, will make this egg sack of babies and, and you can see the picture of one here. The mother will hang around it and it's very oddly shaped, like she wrapped up a bunch of toys inside there or something um, and she will hang on to it and protect it until those babies are born and again it usually happens end of October around Halloween or maybe even um, into into November a little bit. They um, spend most of their time on the plant looking for food but they also do not make webs but they don't travel very far so if you take cut flowers out of your garden in the springtime or the summer and you find little spiders in those flowers, it's probably a lynx spider most likely. There's some other spiders that do just really interesting things. Spiders can mimic ants. You've got arachnids mimicking insects in this case. So there's, there's an orange ant mimic. The three banded in the center has three lighter colored orangey yellow bands across it. And while they, when you look at them right away, they don't necessarily look so much like an ant, um, but when you see them kind of in the wild, it'll make you think twice if it's an ant or a spider. But the one on the right, the very far right, that ant mimic jumper really does resemble an ant. The top of the cephalothorax looks almost like an ant's head. It's like it's got fake looking little eyeballs on the side and it looks like it is made up of three different body parts. Um, so they can mimic ants for whatever reason they want to, which I think is just kind of a neat thing about mother nature. We have some other spiders that are pretty large. Um, one of those being the southwestern trapdoor spider and another one being the purse web spider. And you know, when you look at these two pictures, they don't look, they look very, very, very much alike. And if you were to send me a picture of one of them, I don't know that I would be able to necessarily decipher the difference between the two. And it, does it really matter? Probably not. These are not harmful spiders. Of course, when the eggs hatch, they're very small, but they can get to be the size of a small tarantula. Their bodies just aren't super hairy like a, a tarantula's is, and that's really the main difference between the two as far as looks go. Um, the trapdoor spider is really common in the fall time as things start to cool down just a little bit. And this usually happens when we have good soaking rains. They make a little funnel or burrow in the ground, and they put a little trapdoor of silk on top. And when you have a good soaking, soaking rain that gets saturated, it falls in and the males start moving around and looking for a new place to build their nest because they're starting to drown inside their house. And they will move until they get stopped by something. So um, you might find many of them, several of them, tens, dozens of them around your house in one spot because that's just where they all kind of went and gathered and nothing stopped them. And they get stuck up against the house or a garage door or in a corner on your porch and that's not that they're trying to invade your house or having a huge breeding festival. They're just, they just wandered until they got stuck. We do also have tarantulas in Texas. These tarantulas are spiders. They're just the largest and heaviest and hairiest of the spiders. The most common tarantula we probably have in the San Antonio area is the Texas tan tarantula. But there are other species of tarantulas that we can have uh, across Texas. One of those being an Oklahoma brown 
Usually they'll mate during the springtime, and so they get up and running, and this can even happen in the summer. They get up and they get moving around, and it's generally a male looking for a female. And you can have years where you have what seems to be massive migrations of tarantulas going from one side of the road to the other side of the road and, and people just driving over tons of them because they're on the move. And that's not an uncommon thing to see in Texas, although it is a little bit disconcerting to a lot of people. Tarantulas certainly do make very, very good pets. And if you've ever wanted a pet that is very, very easy to care for, doesn't eat a whole lot of food, doesn't need very much attention, a tarantula might be the best option for you. If you travel a lot and you're not home very often, these guys can certainly take care of themselves. They have to be fed, you know, once a month, which isn't very much. So you can go, certainly go on a long vacation and not have to worry about if they're going to be hungry or not. Um, these are some of the more common tarantulas that first timers usually get. I have a tarantula that's called um, a Chaco. And she's from Guatemala. And I've had her for several years now, and she's probably close to 20 years old, I would guess. And she's very, very calm, not very fast. And if I hold her up here, you might be able to see her fangs. But she's never, ever used them on a person or on me, thankfully. She's always been very, very calm. Um, she's just a good little pet to have. Tarantulas are just kind of neat to have. They don't need a lot of attention. They probably don't want a lot of attention. They just need a small space. If you give them a large space, they'll still just use a little bit of space. She needs a cover and she needs water and she needs crickets that I feed her that I get from um, the pet store. And that's about all I do for him, for her. I take her to schools and she gets to meet people and teach kids that spiders aren't necessarily that scary. Um, so I definitely recommend having a tarantula as a pet if it's something that you might want to do. So once again, thank you for joining us for this weekly webinar on spiders, the good, the bad, the spooky, the cool. I hope that you realized after this webinar that most spiders that you encounter are actually good guys. You don't want to squish the spiders. They're good to have out there in the landscape. Um, if you have any questions, be sure to shoot me an email. Make sure that you check out webinars just like this on our Extension YouTube channel, My Extension 210.